All right, good morning, everybody. Um, we have a special treat for you guys this morning. We got the 2016 in Election Like No Other presentation. Um, and if you have been following the news at all, then you have a sense that this year's presidential primary season is unlike any other in recent history. There's been a lot of speculation recently that each of the two parties may not have a clear front runner. By the time their respective conventions this summer and, and that those conventions could feature what has not been seen in decades, a contested convention. A true floor fight to see who will run for president in November. Our guest speaker today uh, will be able to help us make sense of this peculiar part of American democracy. Professor Alan Abramovitz is this year's Presley Fellow an endowed program that brings to the Westminster campus outstanding educators that can make a singular contribution to our intellectual life. The program is more formally known as the Alice and William Presley Class of 1956 Fellowship. Professor Abramowitz is the Al Alvin Barkley Professor of Political Science at Emory, where his specialty is the election process and American government. A graduate of the University of Rochester, Professor Abramowitz earned his master's and his doctorate from Stanford University. He is the author of five books and numerous articles, and he holds something of a record in correctly predicting the popular result vote in every presidential election since 1982. In my politics class this semester, we've been fortunate to have uh, Professor Abramowitz teaching several classes as each state primary brings new developments to the 2016 campaign. Please join me in welcoming Professor Alan Abramowitz. Well, well, th thank you for inviting me to come speak to you today. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I have been looking at the results of the survey that was done here. Uh, of your opinions uh, about this year's presidential election. And uh, I was very impressed by the fact that uh, many of you um, uh, are following the campaign closely, are very interested in what's going on. I know for some of you here, the seniors, um, you will be voting for the first time in November. Uh, and so uh, uh, I'm sure this is especially interesting and important to you, but, but it should be important and interesting to all of you because obviously we are all gonna be affected our lives are going to be affected by the results of this year's election. Now, uh, you might want to think about this year's election as a little bit like the NCAA basketball tournament that concluded recently. Remember back at the beginning of the year, there were all these contenders. So if you look at this picture, uh, uh, hopefully you recognize some of these people. Um, there were actually, uh, back in January, not that long ago, we had 17 Republican presidential candidates, 17, uh, and four Democratic presidential candidates. Uh, and there you see most of them. I don't know if that's all of them, but that's just about all of them. But we're now down to, just like in the NCAA tournament, right? You get down to the final four, only in this case, it might be the final five. So we have five candidates who are still in the running. Uh, one of them, John Kasich, uh, may or may not have a realistic chance of winning the Republican presidential nomination. There's some question about that. I saw from the polling here, by the way, that he's pretty popular among students here at Westminster. I, I think John Kasich would be very happy if the Republican primary electorate uh, had, was similar to the Westminster student body uh, in its uh, preferences. Uh, but anyway, here are the five remaining candidates. I'm sure you recognize uh, all of them. And the stakes in this year's election really are very high. And I, and I don't just say that so that I can show you a picture of dogs playing poker. Uh, although uh, showing a picture of dogs playing poker is certainly always a worthwhile objective. Uh, so you, I, I love that painting. Uh, but the stakes really are high because the future direction of our country uh, will be determined by the outcome of this year's election. There's a big division between the parties. The future legacy of a lot of the uh, policy put in place in the last eight years under President Obama will depend on the outcome of this election. Will we see a continuation in the same direction? Will we see a sharp change in direction? Any Democratic president, I think, 
will probably continue in more or less the same direction as Obama. Any Republican president is going to change the direction of the country very much. But it isn't just the presidency that's at stake in this election. So it's important to keep in mind that while most of the attention has been focused on the presidential election, understandably, that we are going to be electing all 435 members of the U.S. House of Representatives. There are also 34 seats in the U.S. Senate that will be up in November, including one here in Georgia. Uh, we're going to be electing 12 governors, and control of dozens of state legislative chambers will be determined. So many, many important offices, and uh, the, in addition to the presidency, uh, will be chosen. And the outcomes of those elections will have a lot to do with the future direction uh, of the country. And which party ends up in control of the Senate and the House, of course, will be very important regardless of who is the next president. The other thing that makes this election especially important uh, is that uh, we now have a vacancy on the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this. Uh, with the death of uh, Antonin Scalia a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court now has only eight justices on it. And President Obama has submitted a name in nomination, uh, but it's not at all clear that his nominee, Merrick Garland, will actually uh, get a vote in the U.S. Senate. Uh, and so it's quite possible that Republican senators uh, have uh, vowed to block that nominee. So it may very well be that this election will determine who gets to appoint that ninth justice to the U.S. Supreme Court. And right now, the court is very evenly divided between a liberal block of four and a conservative block of four. And whoever uh, gets that appointment to, to be the ninth justice could very well be the tie-breaking vote on a lot of very important issues that the court will be deciding uh, in the future. And there also the po is a distinct possibility that there could be additional vacancies on the court uh, in the next four to eight years. And so the next president will also probably have the opportunity to make additional appointments there. When we think about this election and put it in a broader context, uh, I believe that we are in a new and different era of electoral competition in the United States when we look back over our country's history, especially over the last 40 or 50 years. And the major characteristics of this current era of electoral competition are, one, a very closely divided national electorate. There is a very even divide right now between supporters of the two major parties. But when we look below the national level at what's going on at the state level and at the congressional district level, we see that there is a pattern of one-party domination of the large majority of states and the overwhelming majority of congressional districts. So close competition at the national level, but one-party domination in many of our states and districts. And we also see a high degree of consistency in the results of elections at different levels and over time. And I'll explain a little bit about what I mean by that. As far as close elections, if we look at the results of presidential elections, uh, over the last 60 years or so, uh, since 1952. Uh, what we see is that the last four presidential elections since 2000 have been characterized by very close competition. The average margin of victory in the popular vote in recent presidential elections has been very close, much closer than the average margin in earlier presidential elections. Uh, so we are not seeing landslide elections in the current era, which we did see very often in the past. So we have close competition in presidential elections. When we look at the nation as a whole divided into the many states and regions, though, we see that the country is indeed divided, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, into the red states and blue states, right? So, so this is, of course, this is one cartoonist version of what the electoral map looked like back in 2012. And you see the red states and the blue states, and then these, the battleground states, the swing states, right? Like Ohio, okay? But also Virginia, Florida, New Hampshire, Colorado. So uh, I, many of you may not have realized before I showed you this that, uh, that Georgia here, we are in the region of these snake handlers. Uh, but anyway, that's just a humorous version of what the divisions look like inside the United States. Uh, but the reality is, and what that map kind of alludes to, is that when we look at the results of the 2012 presidential election at the state level, there were very few closely contested states. So only four states where the winner's margin in the vote, popular vote at the state level 
was less than five points. Only four states were actually that close. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, there are actually 20 states where the winning candidate, either Obama or uh, Romney, won the popular vote in the state by 20 points or more. So a lot of landslide states and very few highly competitive states. Uh, that is a big change from presidential elections of 40 or 50 years ago. In 1976, when Jimmy Carter was elected, for example, we had a close national election, but we also had a lot more close states. Uh, and we didn't have nearly as many landslide states. So that's a big change uh, in the uh, uh, nature of electoral competition in the United States in recent years. Okay. Another thing we see is a high degree of consistency in the outcomes of these elections. So uh, over the past four presidential elections, from 2000 through 2012, 40 of the 50 states have consistently voted for the same party. So we have had 18 states plus the District of Columbia have consistently voted for the Democratic candidate. 22 states have consistently voted for the Republican candidate, Georgia being one of those, of course. Uh, and there are only 10 states that have actually uh, switched sides at one time or another. Um, so we see, again, a high degree of consistency in the outcomes of these elections. Uh, you can see the 10 states down there at the bottom, uh, Florida, Ohio, Virginia, and so on, that have gone back and forth. And so most of those states are likely to also be the ones that will be uh, highly contested in 2016, uh, and they will likely be the swing states that will determine the outcome of this year's presidential election as well. Another thing that we see is that to a much greater degree than in the past, the results of House and Senate races closely reflect the results of the presidential election. That is, the party that wins the presidential race in a state or in a House district almost always wins the Senate seat or the House seat uh, at the same time or in uh, a subsequent election. So in the last two elections, we've seen 93% consistency between presidential and House results at the House district level and 87% consistency between presidential and Senate results, uh, Senate outcomes uh, at the state level. Uh, that's a big change. We're seeing a much greater degree of consistency now between the presidential election results and the congressional election results uh, than we did 30 or 40 years ago. So the question our students are asking, you may know this student, I don't know, this is just a, a sort of a, my idea of a, a typical curious uh, a student. Uh, the, kind, the kind you might find, you know, at Westminster Academy or perhaps at Emory University, uh, wants to understand why is this happening? Why are we seeing this pattern uh, of competition in, in recent years? Uh, and the explanation, in my view, is that we have in the United States today a strongly partisan electorate. Now, I know that's a statement that surprises a lot of people, uh, but let me explain what I mean by that. What we're seeing when we look at evidence from national surveys, and political scientists like me rely heavily on this one series of surveys called the American National Election Studies, because it goes all the way back to 1952. And so for every election year, we have a national survey of the American electorate from 1952 all the way through 2012. And this can allow us to compare the voting behavior of the American public over this very long period of time. And what we see when we look at that is, for one thing, the recent elections, especially 2012, have been characterized by very high rates of party loyalty in voting. Voters are voting for their own party, for president, senate, house, all the way down. They're voting a straight party ticket. There's less ticket splitting going on now than at any time in the last 60 years. Less ticket splitting. Now, what surprises a lot of people about this is that um, we know that there are a lot of voters, a lot of Americans who say they're independent. A lot of people like to think of themselves as independent. But what we've discovered when we look more closely at those people is that many independents, in fact, the large majority of people who call themselves independents are what I like to call closet partisans. That is, when you press them a little bit harder, it turns out that they lean toward one party or the other. Uh, and it turns out that they almost always vote for the party they lean toward. So we have independent Democrats and independent Republicans who actually behave very similarly to regular Democrats and regular Republicans. So uh, if you hear about independents and how many there are, I would say take that with uh, a, a grain of salt. A lot of those independents are really 
party. Okay. Now, why do we see this strong partisan voting, this strong party unity, this straight ticket voting going on in the United States today? It's because that the divide between the two parties today reflects other deeper divisions in American society. Uh, one of the most important, perhaps the most important, is the racial divide that exists between our two major parties today. Uh, when we look at the fact that our country is becoming more and more diverse, uh, so the racial composition and racial and ethnic composition of the American population has been changing uh, pretty rapidly over the last several decades and will continue to change in the future. And by the 2040 sometime, the United States is going to become a majority-minority country. Uh, and indeed, several of our states, including California and Texas, are already majority-minority uh, in their populations, right? And so the American electorate is also changing to reflect this. But it's affecting the two parties very differently. And the Democratic Party, in a very short time, probably by 2020 at the latest, will be a majority-minority party in terms of its voters. Whereas the Republican Party has remained an overwhelmingly white party. It has not been affected as much by this trend. Uh, and so we see a big racial divide between the two parties that also explains a lot of the other divisions that we see between Democrats and Republicans today. There's also a growing cultural divide between the parties, a deep divide over lifestyles, values, and morality, which plays out on issues like abortion and same-sex marriage. Uh, and an ideological divide that's always existed, or for many years, over the role of government, but that's gotten even wider and bigger in recent years. A big divide over what role the federal government should play in regulating economic activity, uh, in providing an array of uh, benefits and services to the public. A big divide between the parties over that. I would almost say a huge divide. <laughs> huge. You've probably heard that expression before. Okay. Um, the other thing that we see that is at least as important as this, just as important if not more important than the divisions that exist on the issues, is the fact that Democrats and Republicans these days really don't like each other. Okay? Now, I'm sure that's not true here, uh, and that many of you, whether you're Republicans or Democrats, have friends from the other party. But the fact is that in our society overall, there is this big divide and uh, political scientists refer to this growing dislike that we feel toward the other party as affective polarization. We are divided in terms of our affect or our feelings uh, on emotions about the other party. So just one piece of evidence on that. This is a question that's been asked in surveys about uh, how would you feel, how would you feel, you might think about this as like, how would your parents feel? How would your parents feel if they found out that you were going to marry, or you maybe just dating, you're kind of young to get married, but uh, just dating someone from the other party, right? And back in 1960, when Americans were asked about this, nobody cared. It was like, yeah, that's fine, you know. But now, actually, a lot of people say they would be quite upset to find out that their son or daughter was going to marry someone who supports the other party. So if you find yourself in that situation in the future, you know, be careful what you tell your parents. You might want to break the news to them, you know, kind of slowly. Let them get used to the idea that, hey, you know, I'm dating this guy. We're thinking of getting married. But, you know, he's a Republican or he's a Democrat. So anyway, uh, so that really is a big change in American society. So given all of this, given all of this, let's talk about what's coming up. And uh, both in November and, before, and then I'll talk about the nomination. So normally, okay, if this was a normal presidential election year, I would expect a closely divided and strongly partisan electorate with very few swing voters. You know, we hear a lot about swing voters, but the reality is in the current era of competition, there are very few swing voters left. The vast majority of voters know how they're going to vote. Uh, and they know how they're going to vote from the very beginning, and very few of them are persuadable. Uh, so we don't see that much movement during the general election campaign. The election is becoming more diverse. With every passing election, every four years, we see that the uh, non-white share of the electorate, and particularly the Latino uh, share of the electorate, is growing. And that's going to happen again. It is uh, highly likely that the electorate will be more diverse in 2016 than it was in 2012, and that that trend will continue 
uh, in future elections. That's generally good for Democrats, because Democrats uh, are the party that most non-white voters favor. On the other hand, the fact that Democrats have controlled the White House for the last eight years uh, may, means that uh, Republicans should have an advantage, uh, because it's usually much harder to win a third term in the White House than to win a second term in the White House. Uh, we can follow this historical pattern that goes back many years, that after eight years of one party in power, uh, the out party, the party out of power, which is the Republicans right now, as far as the presidency is concerned, typically have the advantage. Um, so putting all that together, what we should expect would be a close presidential election, where the outcome will depend more on voter mobilization, that is, whose voters get out to the polls, which party does a better job of actually getting their supporters to turn up, to register to vote, and to actually get out and vote on election day. Um, that would determine the outcome uh, of the election in a very close election. But I said in a normal presidential election year, right? Okay. Now, we have some reason to believe that this is not exactly a normal presidential election year, right? We've got two front runners here, each of whom has some very significant political liability. Let me show you some of the evidence on that. This is a chart that shows Donald Trump's favorable versus unfavorable ratings by the American public over time. It's tracking uh, many, many polls that are asked this question over time, right? And what you see there, the red line is the unfavorable, is much higher than the favorable, the black line, the favorable rating. So Donald Trump has extraordinarily high unfavorable ratings right now from the American public. In fact, about 64% unfavorable. There's a couple of new polls that just came out today that show the same thing. In fact, if anything, his unfavorable ratings have been getting higher uh, in recent weeks, right? And then we look at Hillary Clinton, and we find that this doesn't show the dots. She's not so popular either, right? So her unfavorables are also pretty high, uh, higher than her favorables. Not as bad as Trump's. Not as bad as Trump's. 55% negative, that's pretty bad, but it's better than 65% negative, okay? So we've got two front runners who are both actually, you know, fairly unpopular. Now that could change. People's minds could change, but you know what? Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are both very well-known political figures. Uh, they've been voting around for a long time. Uh, very few people are undecided about them. Uh, so I'm not sure that either one is going to be really fundamentally able to change the perceptions that are out there among the American public. So first I want to talk about who will win the nominations. Okay, We have to get through that before we can get to the general election. So when we look at the Democratic race, I'll take the Democrats first because I think it's more predictable. Uh, and even though there's some uncertainty there, Hillary Clinton has a significant lead right now in terms of the number of pledged delegates. And those are the delegates actually chosen in the primary who are pledged to support that candidate on the first ballot at the convention. She has a lead of a little over 200 delegates, right? Uh, and the Democratic rules give her a couple of advantages that will probably make it very hard for Bernie Sanders to catch her. One. Uh, Democrats out award delegates on a proportional basis in the primary. So you have to win by a very big margin to get any real big advantage in delegates. So even if Bernie Sanders can win some upcoming primaries, uh, he's going to have a hard time catching up in terms of the delegates. Second, there are these so-called superdelegates. They don't have superpowers, okay? They can't leap over tall buildings in a single bound. Uh, or bench steel in their bare hands. But what they are is these are Democratic elected officials and party leaders who are automatically delegates to the convention. There are 712 of them, and they are not obligated to support any particular candidate by the primary. And of those who have made a decision and who have endorsed a candidate so far, the overwhelming majority of those are supporting Hillary Clinton. So Bernie Sanders would have to overcome that problem as well. They could change their mind. They're not bound to the candidate they've endorsed. But it's got to be hard for him to catch up. 
So my prediction is Hillary, I, I would say Hillary Clinton has a big advantage on the Democratic side. In the Republican race, things are more uncertain. Donald Trump has a significant lead right now in terms of delegates won, the pledged delegates. He has won most of the primaries. He has won far more votes in the primaries than any other candidate, but he's under 50%, okay? He's won about 45 or 46 percent of the delegates that are the pledged delegates so far. You need 50 percent, of course, to win the nomination on the first ballot. And if he doesn't win it on the first ballot, and we have a uh, multi-ballot convention, which has not happened since 1952, then all bets are off. Uh, and no one is exactly sure how that would work, how that would play out. It would be crazy. Uh, I think a lot of political scientists would love to see that happen, uh, just because we like to see things like that that are unpredictable. Um, but a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of speculation that Donald Trump, if he doesn't win on the first ballot, he's probably not going to win it on a second or third ballot. And then it could go to Ted Cruz, or it could go to somebody else. Okay. So the Republican convention is pretty hard to predict right now. Now, what do we have coming up? Next Tuesday, just uh, five days from now, we have New York. That's a very, very important primary in both parties. Tonight, there's a debate between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders uh, in Brooklyn uh, that uh, uh, I think could have an impact on the New York primary race. But uh, right now, Clinton seems to have the advantage. <clears throat> in New York, she's been leading by a double-digit margin, 10 to 16 points in most of the recent polls in New York. Remember, she represented New York in the Senate for eight years, although Bernie Sanders actually is from New York originally. He grew up in Brooklyn. He still sounds like it. Um, I was born in Brooklyn. I don't think my accent is as strong as Bernie Sanders' accent, and uh, uh, you know, neither one of us has lived there for a long time. But anyway, uh, so you've got... Three New Yorkers in the races on the Republican side, you've got Donald Trump, of course. Trump is way ahead in the polls in New York. Going ahead to the next week, there are five primaries in the Northeast, and Clinton and Trump could do very well in all or most of those primaries. So, uh, so a couple of weeks from now, I would expect that we're going to see that Hillary Clinton, very likely, uh, will have increased her margin over Bernie Sanders in the delegate race. And Donald Trump may very well have gotten close to 50% uh, at that point, and possibly even get over 50% uh, in the total delegates awarded by that time. So these next few weeks will be important. Then Indiana on May 3rd, especially for the Republicans, it's a winner-take-all primary for the Republicans. Democrats don't have winner-take-all primaries. Uh, so that could be crucial in the Republican race as well. So the next two or three weeks should really tell us a great deal. Now, what about the outlook for November? Very quickly, I'll tell you what I think is likely to happen uh, in the general election, although it's, it's really early to start making forecasts, right? Um, one thing we can see is that interest in the election, as crazy as it's been, or maybe because it's been so crazy and unpredictable uh, uh, and rather um, nasty at times, but the interest level is very high, higher than in any other recent election. The percentage of Americans are saying, whoops, how do I get back to the uh, <laughs> Try to get back. That's a little small. Yeah, okay. That's fine. The interest level is very high, so I think in all likelihood, just as it is here, by the way, among uh, Westminster students, I think we're going to see a high voter turnout in this coming election, uh, at least compared to the usual turnout in American uh, elections. Uh, which is not very high by comparison to a lot of other countries, by the way. But uh, I think we'll see a relatively high turnout. Uh, when we look at the two parties, I think it's pretty clear, at least at this point, that the divisions in the Republican Party are deeper and are going to be harder to heal than those in the Democratic Party. When Republican voters are asked if they think Donald Trump, if Republicans would unite solidly behind Donald Trump, only 38% of them said they, they thought that that would happen, whereas 64% of Democratic voters, and this is a national poll, uh, thought that uh, Democrats would unite behind Hillary Clinton. Uh, so even though there's a, a big fight going on in the Democratic Party between Sanders and Clinton, I think there's less, the divisions are, are not as deep on the Democratic side. The Republicans are going to have a hard time, I think, um, 
unite behind their nominee after this, after this uh, coming convention in July. Okay, another thing we know is that the economy is always important in American elections, especially presidential elections. And right now the economic trends are pretty favorable. Uh, job creation has been solid, unemployment has come way down. Uh, it's 5% right now, much lower than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, the economy is growing, real incomes are starting to grow. It's still not great. A lot of people are still not necessarily feeling uh, like they're doing that much better than they were a few years ago. But the economic trends are more positive than negative. So that's good news for the president's party, which in this case is the Democrats. It's usually the president's party that's going to benefit from an improving economy. The other thing that's significant here is that President Obama's approval ratings have been going up. Uh, and they're about five or six points higher now on average than they were four or six months ago. So uh, in some recent polls, his approval rating has been over 50%. And even though he's not running again, how voters feel about the president will have a big influence on how they vote for his successor. And obviously it's good for uh, Hillary Clinton or any Democratic candidate if Obama is more popular than if he's less popular. Remember back in 2008, George Bush had an approval rating of 30%. That made it very hard for John McCain uh, to, to really uh, contest that election against Obama. So president's approval looks good. Right now, and it's early, okay, it's early, but right now, what the national polls tell us is that Hillary Clinton would be a strong favorite to defeat either Donald Trump or Ted Cruz. There have been 28 national polls in March and April so far, 28. And Hillary Clinton has been ahead of Donald Trump in all 28 of those national polls, okay? And she's been ahead of Ted Cruz in 24 out of 26 national polls. So right now, Clinton is leading Trump and leading Cruz by a bigger margin in national polls than Barack Obama was leading Mitt Romney by uh, four years ago at the same time. Okay? He was ahead by about four points, and that's exactly the margin he won the election by. So I'm not saying that this predicts the outcome, but I'm saying right now, Hillary Clinton clearly seems to would have the advantage over either one of these Republicans. Of course, one thing, now, I, I, I'm glad to see that. We, we have a, a lot of nut supporters out there. Okay. Now, believe it or not, Believe it or not, this was an actual poll question that was asked, and this is not, not, not uh, I'm not making this up, okay? Uh, the, uh, there's a, an outfit called Public Policy Polling. They like to ask sort of humorous questions occasionally. So they actually asked voters in North Carolina how they would vote in the three-way race between Trump, Clinton, and these nuts uh, running as an independent. And so what this tells us, okay, well, what this tells them, we don't know. We don't know if there's going to be, and I know, I know there are some uh, third party supporters out here. Uh, we don't know if there's going to be a serious third party or independent candidate. Okay, we know there's going to be, uh, there always are third party candidates, right? So there will be a li libertarian candidate, a green party candidate, and several others, right? In 2012, and I'm hearing from the libertarians over here. <laughs> All right, I hate to disappoint you, but the Libertarian is not going to win the presidential election. But, sorry. But, in 2012, in 2012, the Libertarian candidate got the most votes of any third party candidate. 1% of the national vote. 1%. However, we don't know, you know for example, if the Republican Party splits, uh, if uh, Donald Trump is the nominee, we could very well see an effort to mount a third party or independent candidacy uh, against Trump from uh, anti-Trump Republicans. If Trump is denied the nomination, he could try to run as an independent, although it's getting late. The problem is getting on the ballot at this point. It's not easy uh, and it takes time. Um, but we could very well see a significant independent or third party candidate and that could really throw, uh, throw a monkey wrench into this whole uh, uh, election 
uh, and, and to any forecast I might make. Now, that said, I don't expect that to happen. It could happen. I don't expect that to happen. I think that we're going to see two major party candidates, uh, and we will see third party candidates, but not very uh, significant ones in all likelihood. But uh, that remains to be seen. So with that, I know we don't really have time to take questions now, but if you do have questions, uh, you can get my email address. Um, you can go to the Emory uh, the Political Science Department and find me there, or you can get it uh, here. Uh, it's available, and I'll be glad if you want to uh, send me questions. I'll be glad to respond to them. And thank you very much again for inviting me to speak to you.